Purgatory, Chapter 28 Matter of Expiation We have said that the total amount of the debt suffered in purgatory comes from all the faults, not atoned upon earth, but especially from mortal sins remitted to their guilt. Now men who have passed their whole lives in the habitual state of mortal sin, and who delay their conversion until death, supposing that God grants them this rare grace, will have to undergo the most frightful punishment. The example of Lord Stroughton gives them good cause for reflection. Lord Stroughton, an English nobleman, was at heart a Catholic, although, to retain his position at court, he regularly attended the Protestant service. He kept a Catholic priest concealed in his house at the risk of great danger, promising himself to make a good use of his ministry by being reconciled with God at the hour of his death. But he met with a sudden accident, as often happen does in such cases, by a just decree of God, and he had not the time to realize his desire of a tardy conversion. Nevertheless, divine mercy, taken into consideration what he had done for the persecuted Catholic Church in England, vouchsafed him the grace of perfect contrition, and consequently secured his salvation. But he had to pay dearly for his culpable negligence. Years passed by. His widow married again and had children. It was one of her daughters, Lady Arundel, who relates this fact as an eyewitness. One day my mother asked Father Cornelius, a Jesuit of much merit, and who later died a martyr. He was betrayed by his servant, the Arundel family, who was executed at Dorchester in 1594, to say Mass for the repose of the soul of John, Lord Stroughton, her first husband. He promised to do so, and Wallace at the altar, between the consecration and the memento for the dead, he paused for a long time, as if absorbed in prayer. After Mass, in an exhortation which he addressed to those present, he told them of a vision which he had just had during the Holy Sacrifice. He had seen an immense forest stretched out before him, but entirely on fire, forming one vast cauldron. In the midst of this was the deceased nobleman, uttering lamentable cries, bewailing the guilty life he had led in this world and at court. Having made a full confession of his faults, the unfortunate man ended with these words, which Holy Scripture places in the mouth of Job, Have pity on me. Have pity on me, at least you, my friends, for the hand of the Lord hath touched me. He then disappeared. Whilst relating this, Father Cornelia shed abundance of tears, and we all, members of the family, to the number of twenty-four persons, wept also. Suddenly, whilst the father was still speaking, we perceived upon the wall against which the altar stood what seemed to be a reflection of burning coals. Such is the recital of Dorothy, Lady Arundel, which may be read in the history of England by Daniel. Saint Lidwina saw in purgatory a soul that suffered also for mortal sins not sufficiently expiated on earth. The incident is thus related in the life of the saint. A man who had been for a long time a slave of the demon of impurity finally had the happiness of being converted. He confessed his sins with great contrition. But prevented by death, he had not time to atone by just penance for his numerous sins. Ledwina, who knew him well, prayed much for him. Twelve years after his death, she still continued to pray, when in one of her ecstasies, being taken into purgatory by her angel guardian, she heard a mournful voice issuing from a deep pit. It is the soul of that man, said the angel, of whom you have prayed with so much fervor and constancy. She was astonished to find him so deep in purgatory twelve years after his death. The angel, seeing her so greatly affected, asked if she was willing to suffer something 
for his deliverance. With all my heart, replied the charitable maiden. From that moment she suffered new pains and frightful torments, which appeared to surpass the strength of human endurance. Nevertheless, she bore them with courage, sustained by charity stronger than death, until it pleased God to send her relief. She then breathed as one restored to a new life, and at the same time she saw that soul for which she had suffered so much come forth from the abyss as white as snow and take its flight to heaven. Purgatory, Chapter 29 Matter of Expiation, Worldliness Souls that allow themselves to be dazzled by the vanities of the world, even if they have the good fortune to escape damnation, will have to undergo terrible punishment. Let us open the revelations of St. Bridget, which are held in such esteem by the Church. We read here in the Book 6 that the saint saw herself transported in spirit into purgatory, and that, amongst others, she saw there a young lady of high birth who had formerly abandoned herself to the luxury and vanities of the world. This unfortunate soul related to her the history of her life, and the sad state she then was. Happily, she said, before death I confess my sins in such dispositions as to escape hell, but now I suffer here to expiate the worldly life that my mother did not prevent me from leading. Alas, she added, with a sigh, this head which love to be adorned, and ought to be draw the attention of others, is now devoured with flames within and without, and these flames are so violent that every moment it seemed to me that I must die. These shoulders, these arms, which I love to see admired, are cruelly bound in chains of red-hot iron. These feet, formerly trained for the dance, are now surrounded with the vipers that tear them with their fangs and soil them with their filthy slime. All these members which I have adorned with jewels, flowers, and diverse other ornaments are now a prey to the most horrible torture. O oh, mother, mother, she cried, how culpable you have been in my regard. It was you who, by a fatal indulgence, encouraged my taste for display in extravagant expense. It was you who took me to theaters, parties, and balls, and to those worldly assemblies which are the ruin of souls. If I have not incurred eternal damnation, it was because a special grace of God's mercy touched my heart with sincere repentance. I made a good confession, and thus I have been delivered from hell, yet only to see myself precipitated into this most horrible torment of purgatory. We have remarked already that what is said of the tortured members must not be taken literally, because the soul is separated from the body, but God, supplying the want of corporal organs, makes the soul experience such sensations as just been described. The biographer of the saint tells us that she relates this vision to a cousin of the deceased, who is likewise given to illusions of worldly vanity. The cousin was so struck that she renounced the luxuries and dangerous amusements of the world, and devoted the remainder of her life to penance in an austere religious order. The same St. Bridget, during another ecstasy, beheld the judgment of a soldier who had just died. He had lived in the vice too common in his profession, and would have been condemned to hell had it not been the Blessed Virgin, whom he has always honored, preserved him from that misfortune by obtaining for him the grace of a sincere repentance. The saint saw him appear before the judgment seat of God, and condemned to a long purgatory for the sins of all kinds which he had committed. The punishment of the eyes, said the judge, shall be contemplate the most frightful objects, that the tongue be pierced with pointed needles and tormented with thirst, that of the touch to be plunged in an ocean of fire. Then the Holy Virgin interceded, and obtained some mitigation of the rigor of the sentence. 
Let us relate still another example of the chastisements reserved for worldlings in purgatory. When they have not, like the rich glutton of the gospel, been buried in hell. Blessed Mary Valani, a Dominican religious, had a lively devotion to the holy souls, and often it happened that they appeared to her, either to thank her or to beg her assistance by her prayers and good works. One day, whilst praying for them with great favor, she was transported in spirit to their prison of expiation. Among the souls that suffered there, she saw one more cruelly tormented than the others, in the midst of the flames which entirely enveloped her. Touched with compassion, the servant of God interrogated the soul. I have been here, she replied, for a very long time, punished for my vanity and my scandalous extravagance. Thus far I have not received the least alleviation. Whilst I was upon earth being wholly occupied with my toilet, my pleasures, and worldly amusements, I thought very little of my duties as a Christian, and fulfilled them only with great reluctance, and in a slowful manner. My only serious thought was to further the worldly interests of my family. See now how I am punished? They bestowed not so much as a passing thought upon me, my parents, my children, those friends to whom I was most intimate, all have forgotten me. Mary Villani begged this soul to allow her to feel something of what she suffered, and immediately it appeared as though a finger of fire touched her forehead, and the pain which she experienced instantly caused her ecstasy to cease. The mark remained so deep and so painful that it was two months afterwards that it was still to be seen, and caused the holy religious so much terrible suffering. She endured this pain in the spirit of penance, for the relief of the soul that had appeared to her, and some time later the same soul came to announce her deliverance. Purgatory Chapter 30 Matter of Expiation, Sins of the Youth It often happens that Christians do not sufficiently reflect on the necessity of doing penance for the sins of their youth. They must one day be atoned for by the most rigorous penance of purgatory. Such was the case of the Princess Gita, daughter-in-law of St. Bridget. As we read in the Lives of the Saints, March 24th, Life of St. Catherine, St. Bridget was in Rome with her daughter, Catherine, when the latter had an apparition of the soul of her sister-in-law, Gita, of whose death she was ignorant. Being one day in prayer in the ancient basilica of St. Peter, Catherine saw before her a woman dressed in a white robe and a black mantle, and who came to ask her prayers for a person who was dead. It is one of your countrywomen, she added, who needs your assistance. Her name, asked the saint, it is Princess Gita of Sweden, the wife of your brother Charles. Catherine then begged the stranger to accompany her to her mother Bridget, to impart to her the sad tidings. I am charged with a message for you alone, said the stranger. I am not allowed to make any other visits, for I must depart immediately. You have no reason to doubt the truth of this fact. In a few days another messenger will arrive from Sweden, bringing the gold crown of Princess Gita. She had bequeathed it to you by testament, in order to secure the assistance of your prayers, but extend to her from this very moment your charitable aid, for she stands in urgent need of your suffrages. With these words she withdrew. Catherine would have followed her, but although her costume would not have easily distinguished her, she was nowhere to be seen. Struck and surprised with this strange adventure, she hastened to return to her mother, and related all that had happened. St. Bridget replied with a smile, It was your sister-in-law, Gita, herself that appeared to you. Our Lord had been pleased to reveal this to me. The dear departed died in the most consoling sentiments of piety. That is why she attained the favor of appearing to you and asking for your prayers. 
she has still to expiate the numerous faults of her youth. Let us both do in our power to give her relief. The gold crown which she sends you imposes this obligation upon you. A few weeks later, an officer from the court of Prince Charles arrived in Rome, carrying the crown and believing himself to be the first to convey the tidings of the death of Princess Gita. The beautiful crown was sold, and the money used for masses and good works for the repose of the soul of the deceased princess. 